Today on the Emmanuel Pulpit. And when you go to buy some money, we call it borrowing money. We call it debt. A wise person would ask, how much is that money going to cost me? The culture might say it'll cost you six and a half percent for ten years. Five and a quarter percent fixed for 30 years. Or these days they may say it'll cost you $99 down and $99 a month. Till Jesus comes. Solomon here says, I want you to calculate the price of that debt. It's going to cost you your freedom. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. As you're finding Proverbs 22 and verse 7, I want to tell you the story of a man who was recently in a department store. He came across a table that was full of nice wool sweaters. He knew that cold weather was coming. He wanted one of those sweaters. They cost $50 each. But the man didn't have any money. So unfortunately, he looked. He saw the security cameras were facing another way. There was not a security ink tag on that particular sweater. So he rolled it up quietly and secretly put it up under his shirt and then down into his pants, and he walked out the door right past the security system. He shoplifted. He enjoyed wearing that sweater. Went with a pair of pants that he had. It was nice and warm as the winter winds began to blow. But 30 days later, there was a knock on the door. He looked through the blinds, and there was a sheriff's deputy. The sheriff's deputy had an arrest warrant, video footage of the theft, and a set of handcuffs. When they got the man downtown and began to book him for shoplifting, he suddenly got very sorrowful and he said, I'll pay the money that I owe. Here's the $50. And they said, well, that will settle things with the department store. But now you've got a $200 processing fee here at the sheriff's department and a $250 fine for shoplifting, that, that's going to be a total of $500, 10 times what the sweater originally cost. And besides that, you've got a night in jail. Now, all across America, millions of people do the same thing every day. You say, oh, no, 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 I would never shoplift. No, we use a credit card. and We walk out of the store with something we haven't paid for. We enjoy using it. Wearing it, eating it, riding in it, and 30 days later, there's a knock on the door. It's not a deputy sheriff, it's the mailman. And in that envelope that he delivers is more than a credit card statement, it's a set of handcuffs. And you're going to find that For what you have done, for what I have done in the past, there are penalties, there are fees, there are fines, and there's even a sleepless night in jail. Today from Proverbs 22, 7, I want to talk to you about escaping from debtor's prison. The good news is if you are in the prison of debt, King Solomon makes a visit to all of the inmates. And in verse 7 of this chapter, listen, here's the good news. He brings a cake, and there's a key baked in that cake. It's summed up in 14 little words, and if you'll use this key, you can escape from debtor's prison. Proverbs 22 and verse 7 is our text. If you're able and willing, let me invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Our scripture memory work is done each month from the New King James translation. You'll notice that rendering on the screen. Let's read it together. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs 22, 7. Now read it like somebody that's not in debt. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Proverbs 22, 7. God bless you. You may be seated. In the American prison system, there are literally hundreds of state and federal prisons, and some of them have very well-known names. Leavenworth. Attica, Sing Sing, and even Folsom Prison. 
That's a real place, not just a Johnny Cash song. And in the debtor's prison system, there are some equally famous lockups, names you would recognize. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or in this technological age, PayPal, Apple Pay, one-click Amazon Prime, GMAC Financing, Title Pawn, interest-only mortgage, which is a lie. They're going to eventually want the principal. Just like in the prison systems of America, there are some famous ones and some lesser-known ones. There are some lesser-known jail cells in the debtor's prison system. And you're about to hear about some of them this Friday and Saturday only. 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. only. Limit 20 per store. Zero percent financing if you buy by December the 1st. Or how about this one? 90 days, same as cash. Also a lie. 90 days is never the same as cash. And if you don't believe me, drop down a stack of Benjamins and you'll find out you can get out of the store with cash a whole lot cheaper than with 90-day promise that you'll pay them some money. Well, King Solomon is moved by the Holy Spirit to tell us how to get out of debtor's prison. And in the 14 words of today's text, of this month's memory verse, I want to show you three simple keys. First of all, I invite you to open your eyes and look at these words. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now when a defendant goes to court and the judge begins to read the charges, a a wise prisoner, a wise defense attorney will look over the charges very carefully. Make sure you understand what's being accused. Now here Solomon uses 14 total words, but six of them I find extremely instructive. In fact, you could wrap these six words into three different little groups of two words each. He talks about the borrower and the lender, the ruler and the servant, the rich and the poor. I want us to examine these three contrasts for just a moment. Let's think first of all about the contrast between the rich and the poor. Did you see he said the rich rules over the poor? poor. You say, well, preacher, I already know which category I'm in. I'm not rich. Well, don't be too hasty in your judgment. Just this past Thursday, CNBC released a new study. It was titled in the form of a question. How much money do you have to have to be in the 1%? You know, in the culture, especially in a political election year cycle, You hear a lot about the 1%, especially from the socialists who are trying to take over this nation's economy. And they say there's too much money that's stored up and owned by the top 1%. Well, how much money does it take to be in the top 1% of the world? To be in the top 1%, you have to have a net worth. Would you say net worth? I didn't say money in your pocket. Net worth, that is take all your stuff including your retirement, your insurance, life insurance, payout, equity you have in your home, the value of your clothes and all of your possessions. To be in the top 1%, you need a net worth of $871,000. You say, preacher, that's not me. Well, it may not be, but I'll tell you something. You'd be surprised how much money you're actually worth if you counted up everything that you actually possess. 871,000 puts you in the top 1%. But did you know that a net worth of $93,000 puts you in the top 10%? And if you've got $4,200 of value to your name, you're in the top 50% of the world. That means even if you've got a relatively unreliable used car that you own, you're in the top half. Not the bottom half. You're among... The rich. And the Bible says the rich rule over the poor. Now I emphasize this to remind you the Bible does not condemn wealth. 
or exalt poverty. You can be godly and be rich. You can be godly and be poor. You can be wicked and be rich. You can be wicked and be poor. Paul told Timothy that if we have food and clothing, with these we ought to be content. You know why we ought, why we ought to be content? It means we're rich. Country singer Paul Overstreet wrote a song years ago called The Richest Man on Earth, and it includes these words. Lord, when I wish I had the things you've given someone else, I pray you will forgive me for just thinking of myself. I know I haven't been as thankful as I know I ought to be. I really should be satisfied with all you've given me. We've got a roof over our head, and the kids have all been fed, and the woman I love most lies close beside me in our bed. Lord, give me the eyes to see exactly what that's worth. And I will be the richest man on earth. Solomon says something here about the rich and the poor. I'm reminded that one way to stay out of debtor's prison is to realize I don't belong there. I'm already rich. And so are you. He contrasts the rich and the poor. But look secondly at these words, the ruler and the servant. Did you see? The rich rules over the poor. And the borrower is the servant to the lender. Now, if you have a newer Bible translation, it takes that word servant and really gives it what for us is a more accurate meaning, the word slave. You see, in the King James when, and the New King James, when the Bible talks about a servant, it's not talking about an employee who can get mad with their boss or frustrated with their job and sing Johnny Paycheck on the way out the door. No, 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 no. This is not something you can get out of just because you want to. This text that uses the word servant is talking about a servant who is actually a slave. And the borrower is enslaved to the lender. Now when you go into unmanageable debt, you'd be wise to ask, what is the cost of that debt? You do realize that money is something that can be sold. That's what banks sell. They sell money. They sell you $100 for $110. They just give you a year to pay it back. And when you go to buy some money, we call it borrowing money. We call it debt. A wise person would ask, how much is that money going to cost me? And the culture might say it'll cost you 6.5% for 10 years. Five and a quarter percent fixed for 30 years. Or these days they may say it'll cost you $99 down and $99 a month till Jesus comes. (laughs) Solomon here says, I want you to calculate the price of that debt. It's going to cost you your freedom. For the borrower is the servant of the lender. Chase Bank has a credit card they call Chase Freedom. You may even have a Chase Freedom card in your wallet. Well, that name is only half true. It's all Chase and no freedom. So before you go into unmanageable debt, Solomon says you need to have a perspective about what that debt is going to cost you, not just financially but emotionally and spiritually as well. And to help you understand the value, listen, of what you have versus the value of that stuff that you want and might go into debt to buy, elsewhere in the Proverbs, Solomon gives some other contrast. He says you may be better off already than you think. For example, notice on the screen in Proverbs 15, 16, better is a little with the fear of the Lord, then great treasure with turmoil in it. He says, you'd be better off to be broke and be right with God than to be wealthy and have your life full of anxiety. There's something else he says is better. 
Proverbs 15, 17, Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Husbands and wives, please listen to the preacher this morning. He says you'd be better off to have a dish of vegetables. For us, you'd be better off with a bologna sandwich than to sit down at a feast that you bought at the store with money you don't have and your husband and wife relationship and the parent-child relationship is full of stress and anxiety and even anger, bitterness, and hatred. He said you'd be better off to have less and be at peace than to have more and have turmoil. How about this one, Proverbs 16, 8? Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. To the business owners, to the managers and the supervisors, to the salespeople, Solomon says you'd be better off to lose the business or lose a sale and do it and stand rightly before God than to make money hand over fist by being dishonest and unethical. He goes on to say in Proverbs 17, 1, Better is a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. When he talks about the ruler and the servant, he's reminding us you'd be better off to enjoy a little bit in freedom than to be surrounded by much and be a slave to debt. He contrasts the rich and the poor, the ruler and the servant. And then notice also he contrasts the borrower and the lender. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant to the lender. Now the word lender here has an obvious meaning. It references somebody who loans out money. This is one of several indications in the Bible that borrowing money is not necessarily sinful. Listen carefully, I'm going to say that again. Borrowing money is not necessarily sinful. In fact, some of you, in your business practices, you have borrowed money to start a business, or you have borrowed money because your accountant says it's wiser to do this. There have been times in my life that I've borrowed money, even when I had money in the bank, because my money in the bank was making more interest than what they were going to charge me interest on the loan. There are times that it could be said to be wise to borrow money. The Bible says in Psalm 37, 21 that the righteous man lends to his neighbor. So if it was always a sin to borrow, it'd be a sin to participate by lending. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, 12 that Israel would lend to many nations and borrow from none. Now, if all debt was sinful, godly people and righteous nations would not be lenders. But Solomon also uses the word borrower. Would you say borrower? The word borrower here just sounds like you you went and you got something on time and you promised to pay it back or bring it back. But this word actually means joined to. It connotes a very powerful relationship. The word translated here as borrower is actually used in the book of Genesis to describe marital relations. A husband and wife coming together physically. Solomon takes that word from the bedroom and brings it into the checkbook and says you are changing the relationship between two people when you have a borrower and lender relationship. By the way, for what it's worth, and it's worth much. This is one reason I counsel married people to keep their finances together. I don't know a married couple where I got my money and her money and my bills and her bills and I pay this bill and that bill and the other bill and you pay this one, that one, and the other one. I don't know a marriage where it doesn't turn out to be trouble in paradise. In part because somebody comes up short and you got to borrow money from your spouse. And when you begin to be in debt to somebody, listen to me, the relationship changes. The power structure in the relationship, if you please, suddenly changes. And God doesn't want there to be a power structure within your marriage. Other than the power of God being on your home. It's also why I never loan money to friends and family unless it's a family member I don't ever want to see again. I've made a lot of gifts to family. 
Listen, if it's a close friend or a family member, if you can't afford to make it a gift, you can't afford to make it a loan. He talks about the borrower and the lender. There's a second thing I want you to notice in this one verse. Don't just look at these words, but listen to this warning. Now, the Bible is filled with wisdom and warnings about a lot of things. The Bible warns us about jealousy and anger and pride and bitterness, temptation and immorality. But here, the warning is about debt. Solomon speaks, as it were, to his son and says, Son, don't become indebted because you'll be a slave. You'll be chained to a life that you don't want to live. He teaches that a wrong view of debt will force you to live like a slave. A life, I will tell you, is marked by indebtedness, idolatry, and ingratitude. I want us to look at those three things quickly. First of all, there's a warning here about personal ingratitude. The first two lines of Shakespeare's Richard III include the words, the winter of our discontent. That phrase became so popular in English literature, it was the title of a 1961 book by John Steinbeck, many of you read in high school. When Shakespeare and Steinbeck talk about the winter of our discontent, I can't help but wonder, are they prophetically writing about the maddening rush of holiday spending we're about to see? I wonder if they saw catalogs and online shopping and QVC. I wonder if they saw the after Thanksgiving sales, which now are no longer after Thanksgiving. We are so filled with pride and covetousness and envy and greed and got to have a little bit more and a little bit more that now Wall Street won't even let you enjoy Thanksgiving dinner at Grandma's house. They've even reached into the supper table trying to take you away from a meal of gratitude with your wife or your husband or your children or your parents. And the more I observe people's lives, including the life in the mirror, I discover the overspending isn't the problem. The debt is not the problem. Those are symptoms of the problem. The problem is ingratitude. Like the child who's making their Christmas list while they sit in a room filled with toys they rarely play with. Shakespeare called it the green-eyed monster. John Dryden called it the jaundice of the soul. The Apostle Paul called it the root of all sorts of evil. There's a statement I want you to write down this morning that greed is the enemy of gratitude and gratitude is the remedy for greed. Greed is the enemy of gratitude. You cannot be thankful and covetous at the same time. Could I say it more practically? It's hard to realize that you've already got more than you need and more than you want and far more than you deserve while at the same time use money you don't have to buy more stuff you don't need. Gratitude is the remedy for greed. You'll call me a prophet if you'll listen carefully. In three and a half weeks, this culture is going to go start raving mad. People are going to skip Thanksgiving dinner with their family to camp out in front of Target and Walmart, to sleep in a tent or a sleeping bag on the sidewalk. There will be reports of personal physical injury as people rush through the door like cattle to the slaughter, to rush to the back of the store to get one more television, one more iPod, one more iPad, one more, one more, one more, one more, and the Bible says you are enslaving yourself to debt. And the problem often is we just simply aren't thankful for the things God has already given to us. There's personal ingratitude. There's a warning here also about generational idolatry. 
Perhaps this is just on my mind because I'm the father of four children, ages 15 and younger. But I want you to listen very carefully to your preacher this morning. I fear, I fear that we, we, with my hand up, I fear that we are perpetuating greed, fostering envy, and teaching our kids to live in idolatry because of easy credit that permeates our society. Even those who we would say struggle to make ends meet rarely actually tell their children no. Perhaps I speak only for myself and my children, but I believe they know precious little about delayed gratification. Precious little about being told no. You can't have it, or at least you can't have it right now. You're going to have to wait. This Christmas, it may not be the best idea to get them everything they want, even if you can't afford it. Much, much less if you can't. Parents, you'd be well advised to just tell your children, maybe, why don't you write down three things that you really want, knowing you're only going to buy two. Part of the reason you're only going to buy two is for the purpose of telling them you can't always have everything you want. This is one of the many benefits, by the way, of our Backpacks of Hope initiative. Because my kids will be using their money to go buy some stuff to give to kids. And we're telling them, this is about all those children are going to be able to have for Christmas. You know what they said the first year that we did it? Really? That's it? Yeah, listen to me, friend. That's life. When I've taught on this subject in the past, I've given you a statement. I want to I want to remind you of it. You need to learn to say this now. We don't have it. You don't need it. The answer this year is no. Now, I know that's going to hurt some of you to try to learn to say that. So we're going to try it as a group. Say that first line. We don't have it. Well, Brother Mike, I don't want to tell them no. My kids will think that that we don't have it. Well, you don't. If you're having to put a credit card down or put it on layaway or buy it on time, we used to say, you don't have it. So when you say we don't have it, you're just telling the truth. How about you don't need it? Listen, that's true too. I'm going to give gifts to my family, but can I be real honest? My kids need a new game or a new toy like I need a hole in my foot. And as far as clothes go, we spend half our time trying to get it folded and put back up. Amen. We don't have it. And you don't need it. The answer this year is no. Your kids may may not be able to afford getting everything they want, even if you can afford buying it. Generational idolatry. Personal ingratitude. There's another warning here. It's about financial indebtedness. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Thesaurus.com lists several synonyms for the word indebted. It includes words like hooked, trapped, and bound. And that's exactly what King Solomon is describing. The inability to manage debt leads to indebtedness. You say, preacher, what's the difference? Listen to me. Debt is a bill you owe. Indebtedness is a bill you owe that you can't pay. The borrower is servant to the lender. We live in a nation that is characterized by financial indebtedness. We are a nation in bondage to the bank. The most recent statistics reveal that the average American household with credit card debt 
has a balance of $15,482. That's not counting your mortgage, your car payment. That's not counting money that you may owe to the store. You've got a store account. That's just money on a credit card. The average is $15,482. Those who would make the minimum monthly payment, which by the way, the minimum monthly payment on $15,482 is going to be about 60 bucks, which part of the problem is you're able to live like you got $15,000 for 60 bucks. And people who make the minimum monthly payment only, you need to realize it's going to take you 15 years to pay it back and nearly $29,000, almost two times as much in interest. Total credit card debt in America has recently topped $1 trillion with a T, $1 trillion. How did we rack up that much debt? Well, 41%, not quite half, 41% of Americans with credit card debt said the number one reason I've got it, I spent more money than I could afford on unnecessary purchases. Listen to me very attentively. I know there are people here today in debt, even credit card debt, for reasons you could not control. A divorce a sudden job loss, an unexpected loss of income. You had a trip to the ER, you don't have health insurance, but you did have a visa card, and your child needs medical care. I get it. But 41% was honest enough to say the number one reason. I spent money I didn't have on stuff I didn't even really need. Total household debt in America is now just over 13 and a quarter trillion dollars. By the way, you may not know this, but not only is money something that is sold, debt is something that's sold. If you've got a mortgage, perhaps the bank sold your mortgage to another bank. They, they sold the debt. Well, do you know who owns most of the debt, most of that 13 $0.29 trillion. Do you know who owns most of it? I'm talking about do you know who you ultimately owe the money to? China. And the borrower is the servant to the lender. Listen to me. Your household and our nation is in bondage to a country that hates our guts. That's not a good place to be. We need to look at these words. We need to listen to this warning. There's a third thing that I want you to notice today. Let's learn from this wisdom. You see, the wisest man to ever live said that unmanageable debt will put you in chains of bondage. So in our closing few moments, I want to give you seven keys to get out of debtor's prison. I acknowledge this is not an exhaustive list. There's more that I could say than I'll have time to say. But I'll promise you this. If you'll do these seven things, you'll be on the right road. Number one, repent of any sin involved. Now, I indicated just a moment ago that all debt is not a result of sin. But some is. And often, spiritual counselors, especially in the area of finances... Very often we deal with the financial consequences without ever dealing with the spiritual causes and consequences. I could show you financially how to get on a pathway of financial freedom. But friend, if you got there because of a sin against God, that's not the ultimate answer. Could it be that you're in debt because of carelessness? And if you understand biblical stewardship... Your money is not your money. Your money is God's money and you're but a steward, a manager of it. Could it be that someone here today needs to say what I've had to say in the past? God, you gave me some of your money to manage and I didn't manage it very well. I was careless with the way that I spent it. I was sinful with the way that I spent it. I used it to buy stuff that you did not tell me to buy. 
Maybe someone in the building today needs to just say, Lord, I need you to forgive me. And I need you to show me how to be a better manager of your money. The good news is, listen friend, the good news is, He will. And You can leave this place today in spiritual freedom as you begin working the way into financial freedom. So number one, repent of any sin involved. Number two, surrender your finances to the Lordship of Christ. In Malachi chapter 3, God said the people were under financial bondage in part because they had robbed Him of tithes and offerings. Beloved, the last person you want mad at you is the person that you need to help you get out of debt. You say, Brother Mike, I can't can't give like I want to give. Listen, I consider God my number one creditor. I owe Him more than I owe anybody else. Jesus said that you can't serve two masters because you're going to love one and hate the other or hate one and love the other. And just so everybody knew what he was talking about, he said you can't serve God and money. I've seen many Christians in my life, many in my ministry who cannot obey God financially because somewhere in the past, God was not the master of their finances. And now they're the servant of visa and other forms of debt. What we ought to do today is say, God, not only am I sorry for any sin of mine that led to this mess, I need you to come and take over my checkbook. I need you to be my chief purchasing agent. I need you to be my CPA. I need you to manage the books of my life and the books of my finances. God, I'm handing it all back over to you. I surrender, Lord. My finances will come under your lordship. Number three, you and your spouse must get on the same page. Again, it's why I counsel couples to keep their finances together because you'll never get out of debt if one of you is spending money faster than both of you can make it. You heard about the man who told his buddy, he said, uh, somebody... Stole my credit card number. They're, they're, they're using my credit card number over in China. His buddy said, well, man, you ought to report that to the credit card company. He said, no, the guy that stole it is spending less money on it than my wife. <laughs> you and your spouse need to get on the same page. Last night, after a very interesting day of SEC football, I was on StubHub trying to see if there were a couple of tickets left to go to the SEC championship football game. I found out that the only ones left are up in the nosebleed section. And they'll end up costing about $600 a piece. I'm talking about up there at the Mercedes-Benz Dome where when when they open and close the top of that dome, you better duck. Bad seats. $600 a piece, and you hadn't gotten there yet, hadn't bought any souvenirs, hadn't bought any bling, hadn't bought a $15 Pepsi. I sat in the bed last night, last night, with my laptop. And I decided, well, spouse and I need to get on the same page. I said, honey, I kind of thinking about maybe sort of, I don't know, Kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity here to maybe kind of sort of, well, I don't know. Um, this, this game going to be in Atlanta, and it's, there's just two tickets, me and the boy. Uh, it's going to be great. <laughs> and she asked the question I didn't want her to ask. She asked, how much? $1,200. She looked at me over the top of glasses she didn't even have on her face. That's just the truth. I'm preaching the truth to you today. 
So I, I clicked off that website and went somewhere else. <laughs> you say, are you henpecked? Listen, I told you that humorous story, true story. I told it to you on purpose. You say, preacher, are you henpecked? No. I enjoy peace in my home. I'd rather be at peace with my wife than go to any football game. Especially after the way Alabama played. (laughs) Number four, cut up your credit cards if you cannot pay the balance. Plastic surgery, I mean cut them up, put them in the oven and have credit card souffle. I know there will be some who say, Preacher, in today's economy with online banking and online spending and eBay and Amazon and all the rest, I need a credit card. Well, you can get a Visa or a MasterCard debit card. You can can use other forms of online and automated banking. But if you cannot pay off the balance this month of your credit card, cut it up and throw it away. 41% of Americans are behind on their credit card payments. Another 42% pay the minimum only. That means 83% of Americans are either late or minimum payment only, which also means you're in debt. It's been said that if your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will become your downfall. Number five. Downsize your house and your car until you are debt free. Now somebody here today says, we're going going to get out of debt. And every other day I've been stopping by the Friendly Express and buying me a a Coke and a pack of crackers and I'm going to give that up. Well, that may be good advice, but listen friend, that's not going to be a drop in the bucket to getting out of tens of thousands of dollars of debt. What you need to do is be a better steward of your top ticket items, namely the house and the car. A car is a huge purchase. The only one that I know of that loses a lot of its value just because you bought it. I mean, before you even drive it off the lot, it's worth thousands less than it was before you signed on the dotted line. In his book, The Millionaire Next Door, Thomas Stanley reports that the average millionaire in America drives a three-year-old domestic vehicle. Three-year-old domestic vehicle. Friend, if you make the decisions that financially bound people always make, you're going to stay in financial bondage. When I presented this principle about a decade ago about the house and the car, someone came to me and said, Well, Pastor, if that were true... The percentages that you gave, the budget that you recommended, I'd have to sell my house and move over yonder. Then I said, what I would do if I were you, I'd try to sell my house and try to find me a place over yonder. Well, I don't want my kids to think we can't live here, that we can only afford to live there. If you can't afford to live here, but you can't afford to live there, it's just telling them the truth. This is better preaching than you're amening this morning. Number next, do not consolidate your bills. You're going to be scrolling through Facebook. There's going to be an ad about debt consolidation. You're watching your favorite television show and an ad comes on about debt consolidation. Let me tell you something, friend. Debt consolidation is a debt consolidation loan. And you can't borrow your way out of debt. There may be a few people who are disciplined enough to consolidate their debt and then radically change all of their spending practices, but suffice to say, it probably ain't you. Bad grammar, great advice. Do not consolidate your bills. Number last, stop spending so much money. I mean, this isn't rocket surgery. Stop spending so much money. If you're in unmanageable debt, it's because at some point in the past you spent more money than you made and you're never going to get out of debt until you stop doing that. Stop spending so much money. I mean, if you get home today and there's two inches of water in your house, 
Don't grab a mop and a bucket. Turn off the water. Stop the source of the problem. None of these other things will amount to a hill of beans if you don't stop spending so much money. It was in Acts chapter 16 that Paul and Silas were in a Philippian jail and that night God sent an earthquake to get them out of prison. Now I doubt God's going to send an earthquake to get you out of debtor's prison, but He does want to shake up your finances. And He can do it with 14 little words. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website, ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emanuel Pulpit.